today we will see some uh, national events uh, which were in use in 2023 as part of uh, advising current affairs for problems. So first, uh, we will start with Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, so who was uh, in use for two aspects. One, his death in 2023, and in 2024, you know, he was awarded uh, Bharat Ratna, right? Fine. So now this news becomes more important because of uh, two important events which happened. So one, uh, he passed away at the age of 98 with the uh, most important uh, note that he is a father of a uh, green revolution in India. So who uh, carried forward uh, Norman Borlong and as well as uh, uh, William God's uh, green revolution in India. And second important thing is he is father of economic ecology uh, in the uh, in India, and uh, it was also recognized by UNESCO, right? So economic ecology, it is ecology with respect to economics, and uh, he also introduced the term evergreen revolution. So these are all some of the importance. The most important thing is he is uh, linked with the plant genetics. Okay, in that he is more specialized in. Uh, uh, improvising potato, and that is how Norman uh, Morlong, when he uh, met his uh, uh, in uh, Mexico and other aspects, so he was much impressed about the Green Revolution, what Norman Morlong had, and uh, he started uh, his ideas, that is his uh, improvisation ideas, in IC, uh, I mean ICAR Institute, that is nuclear research laboratory in uh, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. And later, he also became a chairperson or director general of uh, ICAR. So these are some of the most important aspects. And the first Asian uh, to head the International Rice uh, Research Institute in Manila and Philippines. Right. So these are some of the important uh, achievements what he had. And apart from that, he was the first uh, person in the World to receive World Food Prize in 1987 and first Indian to be elected as a president of Nobel Peace uh, Prize uh, conferences. And uh, also he was very uh, involved in various other activities. Plus the recognition for the women farmers, the feminization of Indian agriculture. He was a, a most important person to be so. And now you can see much more uh, uh, important uh, things are there where uh, feminization has already happened and we had large amount of uh, uh, women farmers with respect to India. Okay, So that was in his vision. So he had uh, introduced a private member bill when he was a nominated member. But unfortunately, it got left. But still, he, uh, it was uh, one of his uh, aspects. Apart from that, he also uh, introduced, or he was chairperson of the National Farmers Commission, or National Commission for Farmers. Uh, for that, he was the one who defined who is farmer. He had an inclusive uh, thing, and uh, uh, what do you call the uh, comprehensive uh, methodology in which uh, farmers have to be taken care of, the MSP related uh, updates. So all these were uh, given in uh, National Commission for Farmers. And this particular National Commission for Farmers is one of the bases in which we try to have uh, revolutionary uh, aspects of reforming agriculture in India. Right? Apart from that, uh, he is uh, famous for uh, Introducing the high yielding varieties of seeds, especially uh, rice, wheat, and pulses. So, especially rice and wheat, and later pulses. So, we started having more high yielding varieties, and later we also introduced double cropping system. So, two times we try to have the crops uh, in rotation. And similarly, uh, we had uh, better fertilizers, better uh, pesticides to. Uh, secure these high yielding variety seeds in these regard. So this is how he had this particular idea. But uh, anyway, there were many negatives which were already present. And you may know that uh, it introduced monoculture practices. It uh, had a lopsided development and it uh, restricted only for rice, wheat, and 
few uh, pulses like uh, jowar, bajra, and maize. And uh, a large amount of water is being used. Uh, chemical fertilizers issued in this uh, uh, resulted in uh, infertility and so on. So all these uh, aspects uh, 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 ended up in this uh, particular uh, problem of um, I mean, uh, reducing the productivity of uh, the Indian soil. So, when we came up with the next set, that is uh, what you call the uh, second set of green revolution, when we call it as evergreen revolution, we tried organic uh, set which can be introduced or which was introduced in that particular sense. right? And that's the reason when we expanded to northeastern India and all, we went on for uh, high yielding varieties of seeds, but uh, with uh, some organic touch which we had. Apart from that, many schemes were also uh, introduced and reintroduced or reorganized in this regard. We can see uh, all these schemes which are there with respect to green revolution in India. Okay, so these are some of the aspects what you need to remember with respect to Dr. Emerson Swaminathan. Okay. So now. Coming back to this, the second topic is uh, National Investigation Agency. So this is in news because of the 15 years of its service. So when it was introduced, when the agency was set up? So 2008. Uh, 2008. So in the wake of uh, Mumbai uh, terror attack, so we uh, 2611 in 2008, we had this particular uh, uh, agency set up and it started functioning since 2009. So this particular agency, it is a completely uh, central agency operating under Union of India, uh, Union Government of India and the Ministry of Home Affairs. Right? Ministry of Home Affairs. Fine. So how the uh, director generals are appointed? So they are appointed by the uh, Union Government from among IPS officers and various other services like IRS and other intelligence agencies, right? right? So most importantly, after 2008, it's a statutory body because we have National Investigation Agency Act and also we have special courts under this particular act, which deals with, uh, we call it as NIA special court, which deals exclusively the NIA uh, cases, right? That is also under that particular act itself we have. So, this act has been amended in 2019 to expand its uh, jurisdiction and so on. So what are the uh, powers and uh, aspects of uh, NIA? So what are the different types of cases they can investigate? Hmm? So what are the different types of uh, Things which you can investigate. Terror and terror related activities. Okay. So, terror and terror related activities, then. The insurgency, maybe. Okay. Then. So counterfeit currency and terror funding. Okay. okay. So basically, anything which deals with the sovereignty, security, and integrity of India, uh, it deals with, uh, I mean, it is a area where they can uh, investigate. But anything which is scheduled offense under the Act, okay? so under the NIA Act, anything which is scheduled offense, they can investigate. So under this, so they started investigating uh, terror activities, they started investigating various activities under uh, uh, smuggling and other aspects, right? In 2019, they actually expanded this to uh, arms uh, smuggling, illegal arms smuggling, drug peddling, as well as uh, trafficking, okay? So human trafficking and uh, also uh, counterfeiting of currency, cyber uh, crime related uh, issues, so there were many uh, crimes which were added up to their uh, organization as a part of uh, investigation in terror activities because in all these as aspects, terror link is there. 
right? It doesn't mean that when there is a drug peddling, immediately NIA will switch in. Okay, we have Narcotics Control Bureau, which will act in. But in case if we feel that some terror organizations are involved, so immediately NIA can investigate. So now NIA has uh, an expanded uh, uh, schedule of offenses, right? So where it is located at? It is located at New Delhi. So it is uh, headquarters is there in New Delhi and it has around 18 uh, regional branches across India, including uh, uh, many of the uh, capitals, right? So apart from that, uh, this particular um, NIA, whether, how the case will be going to NIA? What is the idea behind it? How the case will be uh, moving into NIA? So they can take it to your motor. Okay, so they can take Suomoto actions, okay. Or state government can allocate it. So state government through the Ministry of Home Affairs, so they may reach NIA to investigate certain crime activities, right? So that is how it happens. So this is the logic how the uh, cases are provided to the uh, National Investigation Agency. So, National Investigation Agency, can, as you know, anything which comes under explosions, uh, atomic energy, or unlawful prevention act, which uh, results in terrorist acts, uh, you can have a hijacking of any um, uh, public uh, um, transport, or especially your uh, aircrafts. And uh, other than that, civil aviation issues, then SARC-related uh, terrorism uh, convention, so offense against that. And similarly, you have maritime issues. So all these weapons of mass destruction, so manufacturing, sale of arms, so all these aspects we have, even IT, that is your cybercrime issues, okay? So uh, various aspects are there yeah, under which the scheduled offenses are listed now. So in this case, uh, when a person, when an Indian is affected uh, by a terror attack in some other country other than India, whether they can investigate? Yes, sir. Okay. So Indian. before before 2019, so NIA was there for whole of India, right? But after 2019, it has been expanded whole of India plus Indians abroad. Okay. Indians abroad and uh, any person who has been, say in case of any foreigner is there, but the foreigner is in Indian uh, vessels, say Indian property, say for example, an Indian ship or um, air, aircraft, Indian aircraft, so likewise. So in that particular case, that can also be investigated. So any Indian within India or outside India, in case if they are affected with the terror act, they can be investigated by NIA. And similarly, any person within the Indian property, so in case if they are there, they can be uh, taken up with the probe. So this is the status after uh, 2019 amendment, which we are there. Yeah. So these are some of the important uh, aspects what we have with respect to NIA. Yeah. So remember that, so appointments, removal, and how they are uh, functioning, what all the offenses uh, they can come under. So similarities, dissimilarities between the CBI and these guys. So try to have a look upon them, yeah? Okay. And uh, then comes the Press Information Bureau. So this is because in 1923 it was set up. And uh, for that reason, we have it as 100 years of celebration, okay, 100 years of celebration, fine. So this particular press information bureau, the origin uh, happened with the Government of India Act 1919, okay. The origin came up with Government of India Act 1919, where there was a provision for the, uh, what do you call the uh, reporting Indian Affairs to London, okay? So with that only, it all started. And later, what happened in uh, um, 
later in 1920 there was a small cell which came in and they had a central bureau of investigation which was set up uh, in this regard so one such uh, thing came up in the press committee so you would have studied press committee uh, in uh, press regulation right so in this particular uh, press regulation in 1921 so they started having some note regarding this particular uh, uh, setting up of this um, press information bureau or at that time it was uh, i mean uh, central bureau of Inves uh, information right so this press uh, committee or press law committee which was there uh, in 1921 anybody remember who headed this particular committee you would have seen in press regulation in modern india as part of it peg bahadur sapu right so he was the one who headed this press committee which recommended for repealing of those uh, harmful acts uh, against Indian press, right? So in Minto's time, uh, we had many Indian press uh, regulation acts which were there, registration acts were there. So all these were recommended to be uh, repealed under this particular thing in 1921. So remember that, so it can be asked. So try to have these uh, aspects which are there. So this is how it originated. Similarly, you need to remember three things. We have Press Information Bureau, we have Press Trust of India, and we have Press Council of India. So try to uh, go through all these three. Okay, what are the differences between these three? So what are the three different aspects of these? What is uh, Press Information Bureau? What is uh, the aspect of uh, Press Trust of India? And what is uh, Press Council of India? So any idea? So uh, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but the Press Information Bureau, uh, it releases the government's decisions and their major schemes and the government's vision with respect to different sectors. So exactly, it's under Ministry of i &B. Mm. Uh, Press Council of India, it's a statutory body and I mm. think it regulates journalism in the country. Mm. Press Trust of India, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't Yes, sir. So Press Information of Bureau, as you mentioned, under Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, you have all official information of the Government of India will be informed to the public through Press Information Bureau, right? Publication Division. Whereas Press Council of India is something different, which is a, a collective body headed by a retired judge, which is a, a regulatory body where they try to regulate, self-regulate the uh, press, right? Whereas Press Trust of India is a combination of, it's an organization which is a combination of different press agencies, okay? So it's like a CIA we have, right? So Chamber of Commerce, so similar Fiki likewise. So similarly, we have uh, for uh, press, we have Press Trust of India, okay? At times of emergency, previously what we did, uh, the government will give news only to Press Trust of India and that Press Trust of India will uh, disseminate information for all other uh, press and that will be the one single information which will be provided so that there won't be any issues of confusions or fake news or kind of. So that was the idea of Press Trust of India. But in the wake of uh, 24 by 7 news channels and uh, the wake of social media, so almost uh, PTI uh, lost its uh, presence, but it's a very, very important uh, thing when, when, at times of emergencies, right? Okay. So remember, Press, uh, press, Information, of, uh, press Information Bureau, uh, Centenary. Uh, Mains also, they can ask about uh, press regulations in India. Uh, they can ask about that. In prelims, they can directly ask about Press Information Bureau or the difference in these two or in these two. Okay. So try to cover up these two aspects. Okay. Then National Turmeric Board. 
So this is one board which we have uh, in India, which was set up by Ministry of Ministry of Commerce. Commerce. Okay. So all these type of boards, it is under Ministry of Commerce and Industry. But unfortunately, till now we don't know where it is located because it has not been yet uh, decided. Okay. So it can be there are uh, people's uh, voice for Nizamabad in Telangana, which is one of the uh, reason for which the board is also set up. Or uh, nowadays, Telangana is uh, coming down with the turmeric uh, production, whereas Maharashtra is overtaking. So they are thinking about uh, some other place uh, in uh, uh, Maharashtra. Right? Uh, so we don't know where it is going to be located. Some people, they ask for uh, Hyderabad as a headquarters so that ev everybody will be accessible. Uh, to that particular board. So we don't know yet where the headquarters is. So it is yet to be decided. But the chairperson will be appointed by the central government and members will be from various ministries, say from Ministry of Commerce, Pharmaceuticals, Agriculture. Okay, so various uh, areas where uh, the activities of turmeric is going to be there. So almost all ministries are going to be represented in this board. Okay, so what is the status of uh, even Ayush ministry? You have a member from that. Okay, fine. So what is the status of uh, production of uh, turmeric uh, in India? So India is the largest producer and uh, consumer and exporter of turmeric, right? Fine. What is a medical component we have it in turmeric? Antibiotic. And that's what. What is that uh, name of the component which is extracted from turmeric? So we have curcumin. So curcumin is a component compound which is uh, extracted from turmeric, which is going to be acting as antibiotic. Say so it is a antibiotic, anti-fungal, uh, okay, so anti-parasitic, so it's almost uh, uh, antiseptic, yes, so it's almost in variety of uh, sense we can use it, okay. So India is the largest producer, consumer and exporter of turmeric. So what about uh, the global consumption? It's almost, uh, I mean, production, 75% of the global production, we make it in turmeric. So largest producing states, so we have Maharashtra, Telangana, then Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, right? So these are some of the major uh, turmeric producers in India, right? So we account for more than 75% of the uh, global uh, production of turmeric and also uh, in trade, we have around more than 60% of the global trade, we have it with turmeric. Yeah. So this is something important with respect to turmeric. So try to catch up with the turmeric growing areas, conditions for growing turmeric. So conditions for growing turmeric is very uh, simple. So you need moderate temperature. So 25 to 35 uh, degrees Celsius and uh, about 150 centimeters of rain is enough. A normal loamy soil is uh, a bit well suited soil for growing turmeric and it's a perennial plant so you can just continuously uh, have it right so turmeric so these turmeric uh, what is this part called as whether it is root or stem or what type of uh, thing this rhizome so root root, root. Hmm? is it Yes, sir. Any anybody else? So it is the rhizome is root. Okay, that's why we call it as rhizome, right? Fine. So it's almost similar to ginger. 
kind of right? fine. So these are some information which you need to know about turmeric, and it's uh, uh, importance. Fine. So where is, uh, I mean, um, turmeric, uh, where it is native to? India. So it is primarily India. Okay. Southeast Asia, but primarily India. Right. Okay. Then, so another important uh, uh, news, what we have is India's first lighthouse festival was uh, celebrated in Goa. So we have a fort called uh, Fort Agoda. And this fort, we had this first uh, Lighthouse Festival celebrated in 2023, right? So why it was celebrated? To cherish the past and presence of our uh, maritime exposure and all these aspects. So it's a simple news, but uh, they can ask about uh, Fort Agoda, which was uh, built by Portuguese way back. Okay, and this particular lighthouse, which is in the picture. So this is a place where the first uh, lighthouse festival was celebrated in 2023. And this came into function in 1864, right? Okay, so you can uh, read just a few facts on Fort Agoda and uh, uh, the lighthouse in general. So it comes under Ministry of uh, Shipping and we have separate Director General also for this particular thing. And apart from that, uh, what which was the oldest lighthouse in India? Oldest lighthouse in India. So Chennai. No, not near. Uh, near Chennai. Mahabali. Chennai is not a natural port, right? So it is Mahabalipuram. Okay. So Mahabalipuram, the port of Pallavas. So that in that uh, you have a lighthouse, which was the uh, oldest one. So that was uh, built by Pallavas originally, and later it was improvised. Anyway, this was uh, commissioned uh, only in 1887 later, that is after Pallavas, so in, uh, during the European time. So we had it uh, coming up in 1887, but before that, this particular uh, port was in function. So that's the reason why we went on for this uh, as a first uh, lighthouse festival in Goa, right? Okay, so which is the tallest uh, lighthouse in India? In any idea where it would have been located? So it is in Kerala. Okay. So it is in Kerala. Virinjim. In Kovalam Beach. Near Trivandrum. Trivandrum. So it was uh, functioning since 1904. So this was a tallest in India. Okay. So anyway, so these are some of the important uh, news which we have in this segment. Okay. Thank you.